Let's bow our heads for prayer. Lord, thank you for the privilege of opening your word together. As we do that today, we ask that your spirit that you have promised will be here. Touch our hearts. Show us things that help us understand more about you and your ways. In Jesus' name, amen. Back in the Midwest, uh, in the certain season of the year, you, we would get cottonwood fluff. Around here, the desert broom plant gets its fuzz going. Uh, in, in Minnesota, if I left my garage door open for just a few minutes at the wrong time of year, I would get drifts of cottonwood fluff. The lightest, airiest stuff moves with a puff of wind. It's actually worthless, kind of irritating, wish it wasn't there at all. Um, and, and that illustrates one of the concepts that's important in Hebrew thinking, the concept of light versus heavy. Light is that which is worthless, uh, no substance to it, uh, and cottonwood fluff and, and desert broom fluff illustrate light quite nicely. The opposite is heavy. Uh, a bunch of us here have lived through the 1970s and can remember saying, that's heavy, man. Well, heavy in Hebrew thinking is the opposite of light. It's important. It's valuable. It has substance. And, and those two concepts balancing against each other are used quite a lot in scripture and in some places it helps us understand what the Bible is saying to bring that contrast into mind when we come to those passages. Illustrating the idea of heavy, if we go to Genesis chapter 13 verse 2, talking about Abraham and it says he was very rich in livestock, in silver, and in gold. If you check into the words that used there, the word rich actually means heavy. He was very heavy with wealth and material. Heavy wealth. Proverbs 27, verse 13, it says, A stone is heavy, and sand is weighty, but a fool's wrath is heavier than both. Uh, the, the idea of weight or importance or significance is heavy. Job chapter 6. Job chapter 6. This is Job speaking. Verse 1 through 3. Then Job answered and said, Oh, that my grief were fully weighed, and my calamity laid with it on the scales. For then it would be heavier than the sand of the sea. Therefore my words have been rash. He says, My calamity, my suffering, would be heavier than the sand of the sea. And sand is one of the things that gets a couple of places where it compares that to heavy in scripture, using it as an illustration. And it's true. If you have a bucket of rocks, it's heavy. And a bucket of sand is also very heavy. It's rock ground small and leaves very little space between. Sand is not light. It's very heavy. Uh, and then in Isaiah chapter 24, using heavy to speak of uh, the, the guilt and the weight of transgression. Isaiah chapter 24, verse 20. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard and shall totter like a hut. Its transgression shall be heavy upon it and it will rot, fall and not rise again. Transgression and heavy. Then the opposite of heavy is light. The second Kings chapter 3. 2 Kings chapter 3. Uh, Israel uh, and a couple of neighbor nations are allied together against uh, a fourth nation. Uh, 
2 Kings chapter 3, beginning in verse 17. For thus says the Lord, You shall not see wind, nor shall you see rain. Yet that valley shall be filled with water, so that you, your cattle, and your animals may drink. They were running out of water. Uh, they were about to be attacked by their enemies. And God says, dig the valley full of ditches and places for water to collect. There was no rain, there were no clouds, but water came running down through the dry valley, probably from a distant shower, filled all their ditches. Verse 18, and this is a simple matter in the sight of the Lord. He will also deliver the Moabites into your hand. It's a simple matter. Where it says simple, it means actually light. This is a light thing. That's easy, says God. I can fill the valley with water anytime I wish. I don't need rain clouds. I don't need wind. He can do it without rain at all. He can fill it with water, which he did. It's a simple thing or a light thing for God. And then 1 Kings chapter 16. Another example of light. 1 Kings chapter 16, beginning in verse 30. Now Ahab the son of Omri did evil in the sight of the Lord, more than all who were before him. And it came to pass as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took as wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians. And he went and served Baal and worshipped him. As if it was a trivial thing. In the Hebrew, that's a light thing. As if it had been a small thing to be as sinful as Jeroboam. He goes off and marries Jezebel. What it's really saying is it was awful. <laughs> Very bad. But he treats it as if it was a small thing uh, and does even worse than that. Numbers chapter 21. an account of Israel in the wilderness. Uh, and on this occasion, they're complaining to God about the way he has provided for them. Numbers chapter 21, beginning in verse 5. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no more food and no water and our soul loathes this worthless bread. King James, our soul loathes this light bread. It, it, worthless. It, it's nothing. It, 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 it's of no value to us. It's a light thing. It's cottonwood fluff. Uh, it's a light thing. Our soul loathes this light bread. Then Zephaniah. One of the last little books in the Old Testament. Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 4. Her prophets are insolent, treacherous people. Her priests have polluted the sanctuary. They have done violence to the law. Her prophets are light, says the Hebrew. They are light and treacherous. They are worthless. They are junk. Uh, they have no real value. And then in 2 Kings chapter 20, this is Hezekiah. When God told him you're going to die and he asked for more time. And the Lord said, okay, I'll give it to you. Uh, and as a sign that you are going to get well, uh, would you rather have the shadow on the sundial go forward 10 degrees or go backward 10 degrees? Uh, and uh, 2 Kings 20, verse 9 through 11. 
Then Isaiah said, This is the sign to you from the Lord, that the Lord will do the thing which he has spoken. Shall the shadow go forward 10 degrees or go backward 10 degrees? Hezekiah answered, It is an easy thing or a light thing for the shadow to go down 10 degrees. No, but let the shadow go backward 10 degrees. Just from a physics of the universe point of view, yes, it's easier to get the shadow to go forward 10 degrees. That's the way it's going anyway. (laughs) To get it to go back never has happened. Now, I can conceive of a way, I can't do this, but a way you can get it to go forward 10 degrees, just suspend the animation of all living things for about 40 minutes. And when we wake up, it's 40 minutes later. But to go backward, you you got to mess with the rotation of the earth or something on the order of massive changes to the order of the universe. Physics, not in the ordinary. It doesn't work that way. And so Isaiah says, it's, it's a light thing to go forward. We're going to make it go back because that's the one that will really show something. Then in Isaiah chapter 49, uh, I, I like this verse because it shows us a nice insight into God's heart as he's working the plan of salvation through Israel, but for the benefit of the rest of the world. Uh, Isaiah 49, verse 6. Indeed, he says, It is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob, or a light thing. It is a light thing that you would be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel, I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles, that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. God says, that's too small. And it's not like God to do things in a small way. The cheapest, cut the corners, do the minimal. No, God goes overboard with everything he does. Not only does Jesus die for the sins of the repentant, he dies for the sins of the whole world. God provides salvation for everybody, not just for Israel, yes, for Israel, but not for them alone. God says, that's, that's too small. And it's not like him to go small. It's like him to go big and over and abundant and beyond, even what we can even ask or think. Matthew chapter 11, a familiar verse. Matthew chapter 11 Verse 30, Jesus says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Well, thinking about burden as light in the context of light and heavy, light means nothing, empty and and, and hardly even perceptible. I've got a little day pack at home. I sometimes take on our morning walks and I have a, a small jug of water in there and Uh, Maybe a can of bug spray. I don't know why. There's no bugs in Arizona most of the time. But anyway, a couple of very small things in there. It's just a little bitty back uh, knapsack with two strings that cinch at the top and come around my shoulders. And when I first looked at that, I thought, that thing's going to be terribly uncomfortable. Those strings are going to cut into my shoulders. I'm not going to like this thing. It's so small and so light. Most of the time, I don't even know it's there. Don't even feel it at all. Just hardly even aware of its presence. Now that, I think, is what Jesus is saying. When he says, my burden is light. You will hardly even notice it. If you're you're connected to him, uh, and if he's living his life in us, the things he asks asks us to do are not going to be burdensome. They're going to be easy, easy almost trivial, almost unnoticed, not a bother at all. Then Isaiah 65. And this is a a verse where the idea of light and heavy makes a significant difference on how it reads to us. Isaiah 65, verse 17. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, 
and the former shall not be remembered or come to mind. When the new earth, when we're there, the former things will not be remembered or come to mind. Now, I used to think that God was going to push the button and zap the memories. <laughs> but that's not quite what the Hebrews says. It won't be remembered or come to mind. That is, it won't come upon the heart or it won't weigh on the heart. It's the idea of light and heavy, not specifically stated here, but that's kind of the concept behind what God is saying. And he's saying the former things will not have any significance. They won't be important to you anymore. They won't weigh on your heart. Uh, in uh, early writings, uh, page 17, uh, Ellen White in vision arrives in heaven and they meet brothers Fitch and Stockman, whom she says the Lord laid in the grave shortly before the disappointment in 1844. He laid them in the graves to save them. So brother Fitch and Stockman see the believers who now have arrived in heaven and say, hey, tell us about the troubles you went through between the time we died uh, and the coming. And so uh, Ellen says, well, we tried to think of our greatest troubles and they just seemed so small and so insignificant. We just couldn't talk about it. It wasn't worth talking about light. So light, it doesn't matter to us anymore. Now, it's true that things are troubles to us here. Now, yes, they are. But all the troubles of this world when we get to heaven won't weigh anything against the glory and the perfection of heaven. And it's not as if we couldn't think about them or couldn't remember them. They just don't matter. Why would you want to think about them? Why would you want to uh, spend any time or energy in, in the beauty and perfection of heaven going back and reliving things that are done and gone and don't matter anymore? Uh, it's over. It's finished. We won't care to bring it up. And have, Ellen says, they said, oh, heaven is cheap enough. It's cheap enough. Matthew 5, verse 19. Another spot where the idea of light and heavy is helpful in understanding what the scripture is saying. Matthew 5, 19, whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he should be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now at first read to a Western mind, that sounds like the ones who break the commandments and teach men so are going to make it in the gate, but just barely. Just barely, just past the bar. But when you take it through the eyes of light and heavy, and they will be called least or lightest, not just light, worthless, but the most light, the most worthless thing we can think of in the kingdom of heaven. Doesn't necessarily mean they'll be there. That's what they will be talked about as in God's kingdom, the lightest, most worthless thing imaginable. Uh, and so it takes a different perspective when we look at it in, in the eyes of light versus heavy. Those who do not obey God's commandments and teach men the same will be considered the least, the, the, the least in the kingdom of heaven Worthless, lightest. Now, there's a related concept in Scripture. It's a very commonly used form of comparison logic uh, where it is often uh, worded, how much more? If this is true, how much more that is true? So we take an example which is kind of the, the small example, and say, if it's true for this little thing, then it certainly is true for this greater thing over here. And Jesus uses that logic quite a number of times. Uh, and 
Uh, Luke 23, 31 is a place where he uses that kind of concept. Now, in some of these examples, he doesn't use the actual words, how much more, but he's comparing two things, smaller and greater. Luke 23, verse 31. For if they do these things in the green wood, what will be done in the dry? Jesus is talking about the, the persecution and opposition that he received. And he's the green wood. How about the rest of us when things go badly, when we are facing opposition? Is it going to go easy for us? Oh, no. Uh, if Jesus, the Son of God, was treated as badly as he was, don't think we're getting off light or easy. Uh, if this one is so, this one more so. Jeremiah chapter 12. Jeremiah chapter 12 and verse 5. If you have run with the footmen and they have wearied you, how then can you contend with horses? And if in the land of peace in which you trusted they wearied you, then how will you do in the floodplain of the Jordan? Uh, if you can't handle the footmen, you won't deal with the horses. If small things make trouble for us, if we don't handle them well, how about the big things when they come? How much more they will trouble us? Deuteronomy chapter 31. Moses' farewell sermon to Israel. And he reminds them uh, that they have not always done exactly as the Lord would want them to do. For I know your rebellion, verse 27 of De Deuteronomy 31, for I know your rebellion and your stiff neck. If today, while I am yet alive with you, you have been rebellious against the Lord, then how much more after my death? How much more? There it's actually stated out plainly, how much more? If while I'm alive you've been rebellious like this, how much more so once I am dead? Then Luke 12. A, a passage that deals with worry and trust, trusting God to take care of our basic needs. Luke chapter 12, verse 24 through 28. Consider the ravens. For they neither sow nor reap, which have neither storehouse nor barn, and God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than birds? Now there's the idea. If God takes care of the birds, how much more will he take care of us? And which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? Foot and a half. Not going to happen. Worrying about it doesn't make us shorter, doesn't make us taller. Time will make me shorter. <laughs> But worry can't touch it. If you then are not able to do the least, why are you anxious for the rest? There's a chance of doing something about your stature. Not much, but in theory, maybe. But the bigger things that are in God's domain, we can't do anything with them. Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothes the grass, which today is in the field and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? If God takes care of the ravens and the flowers of the field, how much more will he take care of us who are of more value than ravens and flowers of the field. Matthew 7. 
verse 11. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? And in some of the other Gospels, it's how much more will he give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Do we give good gifts to our children? Yes, and it says you don't give them a stone when they ask for bread. You don't give them a snake when they ask for a fish. You give good things to your children. We are limited. We are sinful people. But God uh, says uh, he is not. And we ourselves can do good things for our kids. Certainly God will do even more so for us. He will give good things to those who uh, ask him. Luke chapter 13. We'll look at some uh, practical applications here uh, of some of these concepts. Luke chapter 13, verse 10 to 16. This is a woman who had been infirm for 18 years and could not stand up straight. The bent woman, we sometimes call her. Uh, and verse 12 through 16, uh, verse 12. But when Jesus saw her, this is in the synagogue on Sabbath, he called her to him and said to her, woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. And he laid his hands on her and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. But the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. And he said to the crowd, there are six days on which men ought to work. Therefore, come and be healed on them and not on the Sabbath day. The Lord then answered him and said, hypocrite, does not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or donkey from the stall and lead it away to water it? So ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, think of it, for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath? Look at what Jesus is saying here, and, and, and let's pick it apart just a little bit. Because when we look at the details in what he said, it becomes more clear the kind of contrast he's making. He says, you'll do it for an ox or a donkey. Shouldn't I do it for this woman? Well, he's comparing an ox or a donkey with a daughter of Abraham. Not just a woman, but a daughter of Abraham. One of the chosen seed of Israel. Uh, which is more important, an ox or a donkey? Or the woman who is a daughter of Abraham? Well, clearly the woman is more important. And the ox or donkey has been tied up. Tied up in their stall, in their barn. But this woman has been bound by Satan. Which is worse, to be tied up in your stall as a donkey? Or to be bound by Satan? Well, clearly to be bound by Satan is the worst. And the donkey or the ox has only been tied up for a few hours. This woman has been bound for how long, he said? Think about that. 18 years. So you can see the, the small and the great. The ox versus the woman. Tied in a stall versus bound by Satan. Uh, a few hours of being tied up versus 18 years of bondage. How much more? If it's true that it's okay to take the ox out for water on the Sabbath, then it is. Jesus says, it sure ought to be okay to set this woman loose from her bondage to Satan, what she had been bound in for 18 years. And so the, 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 the how much more uh, logic is very, very central to what he's saying there. And then 2 Corinthians chapter 4 Verse 17 and 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Verse 17 and 18. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. 
For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Here, Paul is using light, heavy, small, and great in a, in a complex pattern of comparisons. It's, it's several different things that are paired off as small and great. Uh, and it, it, it's a nice uh, literary work here in these two verses when you, when you pick it apart just a little bit. And it shows us a mindset that Paul is recommending to us. And I want to end with this, these verses here. Uh, for our light affliction is compared to the eternal weight of glory, the lightness of the affliction and the weight of glory. A far more exceeding weight of glory, to be more precise. And, and affliction is weighed off against the glory. Which is better, the affliction or the glory? Well, clearly the glory. Which is more important, uh, the light affliction or the weight of glory? Clearly the weight of glory. And this light affliction is for how long? It's for a moment versus the eternal glory. The moment versus the eternal. And then in the next verse, verse 18, for the things which are seen are temporal. The things that are not seen are eternal. The things seen versus the things unseen. And usually we tend to think of the things we see as more substantial and real. But it's true that the eternal, unseen things are more substantial and more real. The seen things are temporal, temporary, time-bound. The things that are not seen are eternal, permanent, and of more substance than the things that we see. And so, the mindset that Paul is saying here is, all the stuff of this earth, everything here is light. In heaven, everything there is heavy. Remember that all the time. All the stuff here is short-term, temporary light. Everything there is long-term, permanent, and heavy, light and heavy. The things that really count are not the things around us in this world now. It's all temporary. It all goes away in the end. But the eternal things last forever. Let's bow our heads for a moment. Lord, thanks for the privilege of opening your word together. Help us to remember that everything here is light and temporary, and that in your kingdom, Everything is permanent and of extreme value. Help us to prioritize things correctly. In Jesus' name, amen.